This is a production of PBS Charlotte. This week on a special Carolina Impact Seeking Unity. They had to tough it out and they made history. The hundred year history of two Charlotte schools, close together but worlds apart. This is me. One school just for black students. That's when I found, really found out about prejudice. They put in us how to re respect others. And one school just for white students. Lots of rivalries, but lots of friendships developed too. I still have my cheerleader outfit. I could go check and see. Both schools now gone. I always think if I could hear voices of the past, like what would they be calling out to me and saying? But not forgotten. It was a privilege and it was also an experience that I will never forget. Tonight, Carolina Impact looks back at Charlotte in black and white. Welcome to our Seeking Unity special. I'm Dara Khalid. Every new school year brings new excitement for kids in the classroom, but in Charlotte, a century of school history brings all of us a little reflection too about where we've been and what we've learned in the last hundred years. Carolina Impact's B. Thompson takes us back to the beginning of Charlotte's first all black high school and the neighborhood that brought it to life. That sense of belonging, that sense of humanness that we had as one was always the, the Brooklyn, really, second world story. You may have heard of the storied Brooklyn community in the heart of Uptown Charlotte and the high school that was its heartbeat. That would be Second Ward. It's a school that was very well needed, you know, and it's, it's very well missed. I tell you, the learning at that school was, it was phenomenal. You know, it, it didn't get any better than that. Fantasizing the past? Definitely. Not for these Definitely. former students and residents of Second Ward and the Brooklyn community. This is me. This is Ted Kennedy. For their school years happened during a segregated time in America, and it was the community and the school that sheltered and nurtured young black children. When I went to South Met, I was always told I was not going to be able to go to college and and I should not even be in any of the uh, academic programs. And this is from the counselor. Yet at Second Ward, her teachers immediately dispelled that idea. But when I got to Second Ward, they said, who told you that? <laughs> and so that's when I changed everything and I went to college. <laughs> and it was that type of caring in the schoolhouse that carried over into the community. Whatever we did, the community always joined in. When we had fundraisers, they would always participate with us. So there are a lot of things that allowed the community to connect with us on a social aspect and business aspect. From yearbook ads by businesses to jobs for students, ask anyone today and they can call off those businesses and their locations. We would stop at McKissick's uh, shoe shop. That's where you drop your shoes off. The barber shop was there, which was the Tate family. And then the pharmacy, uh, Phillips Pharmacy was right there. You'd stop there and you could go in there for that. And of course, the movie theater was there. My father had his business at the corner of 60 miles also. He had an auto mechanic shop. So he was the neighborhood mechanic. And in the neighborhoods of Brooklyn, Cherry and First Ward, children learn from the cross-section of families in their community. Within a neighborhood, you could have a school teacher at one house, you could have a, a minister at another, and then you could have someone with no degree at all, all living right there. Yet it always comes back to Second Ward High School. It's so sweet and its pivotal impact in their lives. They were still like, just your officer, if you can do it, come on now, get on back out there. <laughs> we're not giving up on you. All the people and all the, the young ladies that were just aspiring to be better and, and wanted to do better, because that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to do better and be better than what 
I had ever thought that I could be. It was, this was such a good experience. It's just one of those things that you just can't duplicate. You have to really live it to understand what good it was. We were always taught whatever happens to you, whatever goes on, wherever you are, if somebody says second what, stop what you're doing and go and help them. Yet within a few years, the vibrant community of Brooklyn and its storied Second Ward High School would both meet their demise through a federal program termed Urban Renewal. And the whole community was gone. It was, it, it still hurts. You know, it's one of those things you, 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 you have to get used to or, or get beyond, but it's still, when you think about it, it's, it's still painful. The other loss, I think, was in the explanations given to the persons who lost their homes and who had to move and who had to do something like that. Promises made about, I believe, when Second Ward was torn down, we're going to build a new school, don't worry about it. Well, that never happened. You know, they made a lot of promises during graduation that they was going to build another school, but I, I didn't feel like there would be another school built because of the location where it was. Today, much of the memorabilia of those days is stored at the Second Ward Alumni House, where many reminisce about their school and community. We all did well survive, we're just good, and we, we, we carry on that kind of importance of that legacy. So how did they fare in life? The country girl who moved to the city did go on to college, Wilberforce in Ohio. And more than 50 years later, she's still married to her second ward sweetheart, who was an athlete. Natalie Kennedy Beard went to Spelman and became a professor of education at Harris Stowe State University in St. Louis. Right here. Jacqueline Fulman Gunter went to North Carolina A&T, became a teacher, and taught at a school with some of her former second ward teachers. And Ted Kennedy went on to become a CMPD officer and a detective. For many of the former students of Second Ward, the nurturing allowed them to spread their wings in life while never forgetting their Second Ward roots. As we mentioned, these old black and white photos are all that's left of the original Second Ward High School. But just a few blocks away, Carolina Impact's Jeff Sonier and videographer Doug Stacker take us inside Charlotte's other century-old school that also opened that same day in 1923. Yeah, for decades here at uh, Central High School, this is where every school day began. Walking up these uh, front steps and 100 years later, well, this is a uh, where the memories start too. Every time I enter that building, I always think like, if I could hear voices of the past, like what would they be calling out to me and saying? Or would I hear a bell ring? Or I just always think of like, stepping in the same spot maybe where there is real connection with people who have come before us. Aaron Alsop, the archivist for Central Piedmont Community College, has a view of this oldest building on campus from her office window in the newest building on campus, right next door, where the college is curating the 100-year history of Central High and Second Ward High, too. We didn't live this experience. This is just our way of telling the stories of others who experienced it for themselves. Allsop gives us a private peek at what may be the rarest item in her collection. So this is leather. It's wow. a leather bound or a suede bound book rather. This snips and cuts yearbook from 1911, 12 years before the old Charlotte High School relocated in 1923 to the new Central High School. Also on display is Anna Elizabeth Sutton's diploma from 1928, the second four-year class to graduate from Central High. The diploma itself hidden away for who knows how long in the home of a Sutton relative. And he's walking on campus with this big frame and came in and said, I want to donate this to you. This is still here. That Central High legacy includes decades more of these donated scrapbook memories. Lots of Charlotte and black and white reminders of what life was like for Central High graduates and their families. Most memorable may be this old hand-me-down high school cheerleading sweater. Which, I mean, it's beautifully detailed and beautifully yeah. crafted. And beautifully preserved, too. All stop showing us the sweater's woolen patches on the front and on the back. <laughs> and look closely on the sweater's collar, where you can still see this old pink tag from the dry cleaners. There I am, the cheerleader. 
I still have my cheerleader outfit. I could go check and see. Uh, yep, former Charlotte mayor and city council member Patsy Kinsey was a Central High cheerleader too, class of 59, 28 years after her mother also graduated from Central. My homeroom teacher, I think, was her Latin teacher wow. at Central. Wow. So it was kind of a family tradition for you, Central High School. Yeah. And I think when I went there, the school pretty much looked the way it did when she was there. Kinsey adds that's pretty much what Central High School looks like today, after the restoration, renovation, and rededication of the old building that she and other graduates pushed for back in 2007. They even replanted a willow tree out front to replace Central High's original 1923 willow tree at the school's reunion celebrating Central High's reopening. It was so excited exciting to be on the grounds there at Central Piedmont Community College. In fact, the old Central High building is where Central Piedmont actually started back in the early 60s. Central High was also the original campus for Charlotte College, which eventually became UNC Charlotte. I would say that uh, my, my fondest memory of all of that building, attending Central High School, was the fact that Charlotte College was in the basement of the building. That's Charlotte sports writer, author, and talk show host John Kilgo, class of 55, who went to high school and college in this old building. He was one of several Central High graduates interviewed by UNC Charlotte prior to that uh, 2007 reunion. Lots of rivalries, but uh, lots of friendships developed too. Because Former TV executive Jim Babb, class of 51, remembers those old Central football games at Memorial Stadium. Lived across the street from the school all my, most of my life. And longtime Charlotte Observer editor Jack Claiborne, Central High class of 50, says Charlotte's largest high school was also a neighborhood high school for him. We're off again to meet a few people on the back roads of America. TV Hall of Famer Charles Kuralt was voted most likely to succeed by his Central High classmates in 1951 before decades of popular on-the-road stories for CBS. It's Jim Beatty pouring it on. But Central High's most famous graduate was on front pages everywhere in 1961. You may be seeing track history right here and now. He still has about four yards to go. He's going to make it. He's going to run the first four-minute mile. It looks like he made it unofficially. 358-6. His track team run? buddies from high school knew him as Jimmy Bate, Central Class of 53, now breaking an indoor world record with the whole world watching live. And now the victory lap for Jim Bate. Let's listen to the crowd. Sometimes it's that competition in sports that brings us all together. Good evening, fellow alumni, Sac Award High School alumni. National Remembering alumni. the teams we played for I'm and Karen rooted Bird, for, Bird. even when your high school is long gone. It's not very often you get to celebrate anything that's 100 years old. I went to the Second War Gym and walked through there. It really brought me to tears where I used to play ball at. And they tried to instill in you to not just be players or athletes, but be productive men and women as you, you know, as you face getting ready to face life. I even get here and I talk about it. The school had so much love at it, it was unreal. Almost 60 years later, these former athletes reminisce fondly about a school that was more than bricks and mortar, more than an arena to showcase their athletic ability in their youth. This school saved a lot of money. For you see, what you are hearing is the story of how young boys became men with the help of a community and a school. They took a real serious interest in you, and they were concerned about your well-being, and all of a sudden, you, and that gave you the feeling to respect them as well. When you went to Second Ward, it seemed like it was a really uh, privileged opportunity to go there. Oh, they have war stories of who had gained. 
You play baseball against us down here, you might as well put an L on your card. <laughs> This guy right here, yeah, he was a pitcher. Pitch he, yeah, I pitched a little teeny bit. You pitched a lot and played first base a lot. But he was a heck of an athlete and a great guy all around. And each has his own story of growth, not just in athletic stats, but in human development. They put in us, you know, how to respect others, how to be, you know, courteous to other people, how to respect your teachers, your elders. A lot of them were more like parents rather than just coaches. Like the time Coach Moten went a step further, representing a leap of faith for a young man. That's me right there. Even though I played football, I didn't have the clothes to wear to banquets and stuff. I had a coach who would take me home to his house and dress me in his clothes so I could be a part of my team. Being a second war Tiger athlete was an honor, even though they had no fields to play on or good equipment to play with. And then there was the racism. This is a whole different experience. They had big, nice, pretty ground where they practice at, you know, field in other words where, you know, we had to walk from Second Ward down to Pearl Street to practice, and all this was right there behind their school. That's when I found, really found out about prejudice. And walking down Independent, we used to be harassed so much every time we go down there, you know, call names, but we had to, you know, take it and walk along. Yet they still had their glory days. Well, they brought that trophy into that day along with the jackets. Oh, you thought we were superstars. <laughs> and they have the trophies and the championship jackets to prove it. My sophomore year, uh, we won it all. Then nobody beat us because we had one of the best backs in the country. But back then, uh, uh, the budget in North Carolina for black schools was a little different. So they gave us state championship jackets and a little small football like that with the the, uh, the, the 4A conference laying on there and all that stuff on there. And he could throw it for The long. trophy case is filled with mementos from their athletic years. While their school and childhood community of Brooklyn are both gone. This is Coach Robert Big Al Montgomery. One thing about their journey to manhood is unwavering. Urban Renewal came through in this tore down. You know, they, they tore down structures and buildings, but they couldn't tear down the heart, that, that what was in your heart about that community. It was a privilege, and it was also an experience that I will never forget. And just how many of us can say that about our high school days? For the alumni of Second Ward, more than a half century later, the love is still alive. Happy birthday to you. We're sitting down for lunch with Central High's class of 1955, where once a month they still get together to celebrate birthdays and share their Central High stories. But Jeff, you've got a story that many have never heard before about the only student who attended both Central High and Second Ward High, a success story from the earliest days of desegregation. Yeah, there were actually four black students who broke the color barrier here at Central High School and three other all-white Charlotte schools. And those first days were probably their worst days, but uh, some schools were worse than others. A lot of folks know the Dorothy Count story. Uh, Charlotte historian Tom Hatchett says Dorothy Count's family feared for her safety at the old Harry P. Harding High School, transferring young Dorothy out after only four days. We were willing to grant her desires to study at Harding High School. Contrary to this optimistic view, her experiences at school on Wednesday disillusioned our faith. So this is Gus. This is the big picture of Gus here, yeah. right? Yeah. And there's the, the Counts family. But for Gus Roberts, leaving Second Ward High to become the first black student at Central High, well, things were a little different. Here at Central High School, Gus Roberts was very fortunate to have a principal who uh, seems to have been much more proactive to make sure that Gus Roberts was um, not treated as ugly as uh, Dorothy Counts was treated. These 1957 photos show the crowd was much smaller outside Central High that first day 
and Principal Ed Sanders was outside too, waiting for Gus and his father to arrive. Ed Sanders had very carefully prepped students before uh, Gus Roberts showed up and said, um, I believe that you are going to do the right thing. He particularly got the football team together and said, I believe that you are the leaders of our school. Uh, you are uh, not going to cause trouble, and if you do, there will not be a football season. There was no brouhaha that, that I remember. Former yeah. Charlotte Mayor Patsy yeah. Kinsey, yeah. class of 59, still remembers Gus Roberts, not just his first day at Central High, but also what came next. He was there for two full years and, and uh, graduated, part of our, our class. Uh, he, he deserves an awful lot of credit for, for doing that, uh, being a part of a, a big white high school. And in 1959, with his senior picture in the Central High Yearbook, Gus Roberts finally accomplished what no other black student had ever done before, walking the stage in cap and gown to receive a diploma from a desegregated Charlotte High School. They had to work it out on the ground, they had to tough it out, and they made history. So sticking it out um, was, was uh, took a hard kind of courage. The Hard Kind of Courage is the title of this James Baldwin essay in 1957 about Gus Roberts. Baldwin interviewing Gus and his mother at their home. One among so many, that's kind of rough, his mother said, with Gus adding about his new school, Central High, I'll make it, I ain't going back. Just hold your head high and go right on about your business, just like they don't exist, and that's what we did. That's the voice of Gervaud Roberts, Gus's younger sister, who also went to an all-white Charlotte Middle School, the same day Gus started school at Central. Gervaud Roberts was interviewed for a UNC Charlotte oral history project in 2006. Then the next thing we know, integration is right there at our door. Every door, somebody had to go through, and somebody had to stick it out, and Gus Roberts was really important in terms of beginning that transition that we're, we're still in today. That's why in a quiet cemetery off this busy Charlotte Highway, the simple grave marker for Gus Roberts, Central High School, class of 59, reads pioneer for the civil rights movement. I wanted to make sure people knew that what he stood for and the things that he did. We're talking with Gus Roberts' son, DeCosta Roberts. Like I said, even though he may not have spoke about his, his time um, at Central High School, I think he basically used that um, experience and basically how he kind of raised us um, with, a, with a toughness and a, and a determination to succeed. I'm proud to have been his classmate, and unfortunately I don't think a lot of people know what he did. At both Central High and Second Ward High, 100 years of history produced school leaders who became Charlotte's community leaders, helping to shape the city we know today. R.B. Thompson is back with more. How lasting are the impressions we have of our high school days? Remembering friends, looking forward to the next steps in life, for many, high school reminiscing ends up as mental pictures of the past. Look there. Who is that? Yet ask any who attended Second Ward High School in Charlotte, and you realize the lessons learned there resulted in leaders for the future. Service for all of us that graduate from Second Ward is a part, it's like our DNA. Mecklenburg County Commissioner Arthur Griffin is a proud Second Ward Tiger, class of 66. Along with other black students, he attended the city's first black high school, which was opened from 1923 until 1969. And it was the educators who made sure that their students, learning in a segregated system, had the tools to do better with their lives and to impact others. They wanted us to make sure that there was some impact when whatever we do, whether it was in business, whether it was in uh, politics or in service in the community, they wanted us to have impact. And they did. 
starting with Fred Alexander, graduate of the class of 1926, who went on to become Charlotte's first African-American city councilman in 1965, exactly 100 years after the Civil War. It was Alexander who led the effort to tear down a fence that divided the black and white cemeteries, Pinewood and Elmwood on West 5th Street, ending segregation even in death. And Jim Richardson, who served 10 years in the State House and Senate, then four more as a Mecklenburg County Commissioner. Yet it was during the final years of Second Ward High School that America saw the beginning years of the Civil Rights Movement, and the Second Ward Tigers rose to the challenge. We were children, children of the Civil Rights era. Uh, 1954, the Brown decision, uh, we were all like in first grade. Uh, but by 1966, the early 60s, we were engaged uh, as students. You go to a school like Second Ward, you learn not to get caught up in a revolution going nowhere. You learn to fight for something, and more importantly, you learn to fight for and with other people. Waddell had attended the prestigious Palmer Institute, called a beacon of black excellence, Palmer Institute was a school for upper-class African Americans, a private school that operated from 1902 to 1971. Yet Second Ward was a place where he found his direction. I came to Second Ward because I wanted to play basketball, and I had a scholarship to a and But I wanted to, I wanted the experience of a public high school. He went on from Second Ward to become an attorney head of the Mecklenburg County Minority Affairs Office, and ultimately headed up a national committee on the U.S. Census. But make no mistake about it, it was the impact of Second no, Ward no, that no, was no, the okay, guiding no, beacon. Out of sight. We reach out to train, to motivate, to inspire the average, and maintain models for the gifted. I learned that at Second Ward. For Arthur Griffin, Editor of the school paper at Second Ward, that involvement included being a member of Leadership Charlotte's first class back in 1977 at the behest of his Second Ward teacher, Shirley Johnson. That led to a career at Legal Aid, 17 years on the school board, five as the chair, a vice president's position with McGraw-Hill Education, and currently as an at-large Mecklenburg County Commissioner. What Second Ward did for me and all of my fellow graduates, they made us believe that we could do anything we wanted to do. As for Kermit Waddell, while he has done much to bring respect to his alma mater, you may have been wondering why you know that name. Well, here's why. This is a picture of Dr. E.E. E. Waddell. He was the last principal of Second Ward High School. He's a graduate of North Carolina a t State University. He got a master's at New York University and got a PhD from Duke University. He's my father's twin brother. He was my uncle. While there may never be another Second Ward, the impact of his administrators and teachers continues to be felt. And just like a rock causes waves when thrown into a pond, so do the waves of knowledge and caring of the Second Ward High School continue to flow and influence the lives of so many. For Carolina Impact, I'm B. Thompson. You can learn more about the city's 200-year high schools, both celebrating a century of Charlotte in black and white, at our website, pbscharlotte.org. I'm Dara Khalid. Thanks so much for joining us. Production of PBS Charlotte.